Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the next webinar of the Productivity and Profitability webinar series. This series is being brought to you by Meat and Livestock Australia and Agrista, and this series is designed to assist sheep, cattle and goat producers to increase the productivity and profitability of their businesses. In this series, we will provide you with timely technical information that's relevant to producers across Australia. My name is Tanisha Shields and I am a consultant with Agrista and I'll be your host for tonight's webinar. Tonight we'll be hearing from Sean McGrath about dual purpose crops. Before I get to hand over to Sean, I would like to cover off on the housekeeping for tonight's webinar. Tonight's webinar is being recorded and a copy of the recording will be available on the Agrista and MLA websites and also sent to you. Throughout the webinar, if you have any questions, head to slido.com and enter the code MAR2024, and then we will address your questions at the end of the webinar. So if you have a question, head to slido.com and enter the code MAR2024. If you do happen to leave the webinar early, the QR code at the bottom of each slide is also how you can provide feedback for tonight's webinar and help us to select future topics. So if you have any ideas of topics that you'd like to hear of in the future, be sure to scan that QR code. Tonight's speaker is Sean McGrath. Sean is an agricultural scientist and a senior research fellow at the Gulbali Institute at Charles Sturt University. He completed a PhD considering the context of grazing reproducing ewes on dual purpose wheat and has since been part of several other research projects investigating the utilisation of dual purpose crops in farming systems and the prevention of metabolic diseases in sheep associated with crop grazing. I'll now hand over to you, Sean. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Tanisha. I'll just share my screen. Has that come up? Yep, I've got your screen just waiting on full screen. There we go, it should be there. Perfect, thank you, Sean. Wonderful. Well, look, thank you. I can't actually see how many people are here, but thank you everyone for, uh, for joining tonight. Um, Tonight, I'll be focusing on the ways that dual purpose crops can add value to, to a livestock production system uh, to ultimately increase farm business profitability and reduce risk. So as I review some of the key uh, research uh, in this area, I'm sure um, not everything that I'm going to say is going to be relevant for your system. Um, and context is always important. And I'll try and point out the context as I'm going through. But I think the important thing is that there will be components um, which are relevant to you uh, and that you can consider uh, as part of the um, enterprise mix on your farm or when considering the enterprise mix on your farm. So from the perspective of a um, livestock producer, to be advantageous, dual purpose crops need to provide one or more of the following. They need to um, result in increased total farm feed production. And that could be both, uh, could be quantity of feed, uh, but also considering the quality of the feed. They need to, uh, they could reduce the supplementary feeding requirements of your stock. That would be another potential advantage. Result in a favorable shift in the distribution of feed supply across the year. Increase the performance of your grazing animals, whether that be their reproductive performance or the growth rates of young livestock. Diversify the income on your farm. And of course, potentially incre uh, increase it. That's obviously a key goal for us. And not reduce the grain yield and profit from the grazing crops uh, when it comes to the end of the season. And ultimately, what we're interested in is the effect on business profit and risk of incorporating dual purpose crops in the system. And I'll also uh, we'll touch briefly on some of the other potential systems benefits. So um, to move to the first question, do uh, the dual purpose crops increase total feed production on farm? 
And this figure was put together by John Francis um, from Agrista for the recent GRDC update in Wagga. Uh, and what this is doing is showing um, total feed supply through the year. And, and most of you will be familiar with these types of curves, pasture growth curves, or, or uh, in this case, the availability of, um, of pasture and forage on the farm. So uh, for my part of the world in southern New South Wales, you, you know, we expect if we get an autumn break to see that peak, um, small peak in the autumn, um, and then then a dip in um, feed available or growth pasture growth rates, and then therefore feed availability in the winter uh, due to the cold temperatures. And for us, this big peak that occurs in the spring uh, as the temperatures warm up. Uh, soil moisture generally pretty good, and that's actually when the majority of our pasture is um, is grown. So this particular uh, example that John put together is showing um, two scenarios uh, for a farm that is um, may traditionally have been uh, a farm that only had pasture, didn't actually have crops in the system and the impact on the amount of feed uh, when we when we sow 20 percent of the farm to dual purpose crops which is the graph on the left hand side or 60 percent of the farm to crops which is the graph on the right hand side so you can actually see on this figure that there's um, there's actually a, a big difference um, in what the distribution of feed looks like uh, uh, under those two scenarios. If we consider the total amount of feed here, it's not really um, that obvious that um, if there's a, an increase in supply, we do see uh, in both examples that there's going to be more um, forage available in the autumn and winter under scenarios where we've got dual purpose crops available. And I should just uh, just um, point out that for uh, the studies that I'm referring to tonight, generally I'm focused on wheat and canola as being two of the, the key options. Uh, and I'm talking about uh, an autumn sowing um, of those crops, as opposed to I know there are systems in some parts of the country that will be focused on spring sowing, I'm going to be uh, talking here about uh, sowing um, in the in the autumn period. So um, the other thing I'd just uh, point out about this, uh, um, this type of scenario here, and we do see you know, these dramatic differences in the amount of forage available um, between the two at different times of the year, is that the modelling studies that have been done um, for this type of system where we're considering a farm that is uh, replacing pasture with dual purpose crops have generally found sort of an upper limit um, of around 30% of the farm to be sown a crop and probably in some cases that's a bit high. It does depend on your context, does depend on your region, um, but um, in terms of a replacement uh, of pasture with crop um, in that scenario, generally not seeing that um, replacing 60% of the pasture with crop is going to be uh, the option. That's different in the mixed farming zone where um, cropping is a key component uh, of the system. So uh, still continuing with uh, considering the question of well, do, does what's the impact on total feed supply? This was uh, a uh, table put together by the late Hugh Dove, um, which he presented in the Clemont lecture several years ago. And what this shows is, um, it was based on some experiments that, that uh, CSIRO had run, comparing the number of sheep grazing days could be achieved from the system with a pasture only system compared to systems where uh, crops became uh, were made available. So um, wheat or canola, and then a system where you had both canola and wheat that were grazed in sequence. So um, sheep going from pasture onto canola, then grazing wheat, then back onto pasture. So the sheep, sheep grazing days per hectare is calculated from the sheep uh, number of sheep grazing an area times the days spent on that area uh, and divided by the number of hectares. And this is an approach that can be used 
to compare grazing value of systems. So what we see here that by adding um, the crops into the system or um, replacing pastures with some pastures with crops, increase the total sheep grazing day. So that gives us a value, an indication that we're, uh, we're actually getting more um, feed available in the system. Uh, so we can see when we just had one, either wheat or canola available, increase the sheep grazing days by over 60%. And when, when we opened up that grazing window further so that the crops were grazed in sequence and they'll spend a longer period of time uh, off the pastures, the sheep grazing days was um, more than doubled. Um, what Hugh and his colleagues put this down, uh, a big uh, a big component of this down to was actually the extra sheep grazing days due to um, additional pasture being available in the spring. So, so this is a situation where by resting the pastures, the, the animals are being moved onto the crop, uh, this enables the pastures to grow, albeit it's during winter, growth rates are not going to be as high, but you're accumulating pasture for use in the spring. Potentially based on some other experimental data we've got, this is an overestimation because uh, if, we're, if we've got a reasonably high utilisation rate on our pastures, we're going to have the situation where um, the sheep, um, given that they're uh, the crop paddocks have been locked up in that autumn period and they're not available for grazing. There's going to be more pressure on the pasture during that period, which means that compared to a pasture only system, there's probably less pasture available going into the crop grazing period. And this, um, while pastures continue to be eaten down during the winter, uh, potentially um, there's a there's a fairly large catch up phase too for the pastures in systems that include include crops. So because of that, um, in comparison, um, some of our other data might suggest that we won't get as big an increase in those sheep grazing days. And just a reminder, as I said at the at the start, context is important. So a lot of these these initial examples I've provided are the situation where crop is replacing some pasture, so probably more of a uh, higher rainfall tablelands type system, which are traditionally livestock systems, and um, and uh, smaller areas are generally sown to crops. That system changes a lot if we if we move into the traditional mixed farming system where crops are part of the system, um, and in that context, we're not um, considering that we're replacing pastures with crop. We're probably more considering that. Are we going to grow, um, so some winter varieties early, some winter cultivars early, um, and those that's instead of spring varieties. So that might um, so sowing some uh, dual purpose crops in March, April, um, instead of um, all of our crops being in that May sowing period and being spring cultivars. So quite uh, quite different si systems. And if you consider this for for a for a traditional mixed farm, uh, where we're we're just, we're choosing to grow some dual purpose crops instead of spring crops, um, quite easily easy you know it's easy to identify that you're actually increasing the amount of total amount of forage that is being grown on that farm. Um, so moving to the second point, do dual purpose crops reduce supplementary feeding? So um, to consider this, I'm going to uh, look at two different studies. The first um, is a study that I assisted with the analysis of, which was run by CSIRO at Ginandera near Canberra from 2013 to 2016. And this was a scenario where they were comparing a, a system that was um, pasture only compared to a system where one in any year, one third of the farm was being sown to dual purpose crops, and that was wheat and canola and those crops were available for grazing in sequence. So in the two lower rainfall years in that system, there was an effect on supplementary feeding, but it wasn't always consistent. So in one of those years, uh, 2013, um, systems with dual purpose crops had lower supplementary feeding, but actually the reverse happened in 2015, 
uh, despite one of the wet crops being sacrificially grazed because of the poor seasonal conditions, um, we actually ended up with higher supplementary feeding in systems that included dual purpose crops. So my point there is that um, uh, there is not always going to be a consistent effect um, year to year. But what we often do to answer these type of questions is use modelling, because what this allows us to do is to consider the effect on a system over a longer period of time. So considering um, the, the continuous effect over perhaps a 30, 30 to 50 year period. And certainly some of the, the modelling now is actually using um, uh, either a, a, a smaller window of time, sort of from 2000, year 2000 onwards, or even you know, proje using projected rainfall um, into the future. So um, a recent study published by Lucy Watt and her colleagues from CSIRO who, who ran one of these modelling studies um, and uh, their particular system, they were replacing 25% of the area of the pasture area with dual purpose crops. And what they found uh, uh, in a particular ex uh, example of Goulburn, so a tablelands environment, um, cooler season, uh, higher potentially higher rainfall was that they uh, on average reduced the supplementary feeding by uh, about 60 percent compared to a system that's relying on pastures only so that's a significant effect over the longer term um, uh, in that system and, and that was particularly in systems that um, in scenarios that had high utilization of pasture um, point point that I'd like to make from this side is you're not going to see that every year of course uh, but potentially over the longer term, you're going to have that effect uh, of reducing your overall supplementary feed requirements. So to move to point three, do dual purpose crops shift the distribution of feed supply? Um, moving back to John Francis's graph that we started with, uh, we can quite clearly see some shifts in feed supply on this. So. We see on the first graph where 20% uh, of the farms being sown to pasture as compared to 100% pasture, which is the solid line. We, we see that um, we get a, an increase in feed available in the winter and autumn, but a decrease um, in the spring. And, and in general, that's probably um, a reduction in the feed available in spring is probably not such an issue. That's when the bulk of our production is uh, and, and often we have problems with utilising all of that feed. So moving it to the, the winter, which is considered more of a feed gap, uh, is actually going to be advantageous. In the, oh, I've hit the wrong button. In the, uh, in the second figure where we've got a higher proportion of crop, we can see that um, effects exacerbated with a much bigger bulk of feed available in the winter, um, but getting to that point where actually we've had a substantial effect on the feed supply in spring and potentially that's actually going to um, cause us some problems in terms of availability. Now, as I said before, what we found with the modelling of these types of systems is probably 30% replacement of pasture with crop is probably an upper limit and 20% uh, seems to be more optimal in a lot of cases. Uh, that depends, depends on where you are and the context. The other um, key shift in feed supply to point out here is the crop penalty, which, uh, which occurs this isn't an effect on grain yield, this is an effect on the feed supply in autumn. And what that's referring to is the unavailability of paddocks that have been sown down to crops during that crop establishment phase. So while there's an increase in the amount of uh, feed, well, a uh, potential forage available in the season, there's, there's a period of six, eight, 10 weeks there uh, where crops aren't available to graze because they're locked up and therefore um, that uh, feed or uh, feed distribution is being moved again from the autumn into the late autumn winter winter period. So absolutely we, we do get a, um, a potential shift in the distribution of feed supply through the year but the key is how do we then utilise that? Um, 
I actually just wanted to though um, point out uh, for our for our croppers, for our people in the mixed farming system, and as I said before, this is this is the question that they're going to ask around feed distribution is probably different. So for for people in um, for farmers in the the mixed farming zone where you're considering whether you replace some of your spring um, spring crop, your um, your main window, uh, your main crops with dual purpose crops that you're sowing earlier. Um, the first thing you're concerned about is well, a is that going to affect my yields, and b um, is it going to affect uh, is it going to how much of that do I actually need to replace? Um, and, and is it actually going to cost me if I do replace that? So this is um, this slide was sent to me by Felicity Harris, who presented this at a at a previous GRDC update. And the the important comparison for um, for farmers in this zone is to compare a spring wheat sown at the optimal time, such as in this case they've used scepter compared to some earlier sowing, sowing winter varieties and to compare their grain yields. Now, this is an ungrazed scenario, and that's actually important. What it's showing that in general, um, you can actually achieve, you generally can achieve comparable yields for those winter sown, earlier sown varieties compared to those spring varieties sown in the optimal window it's not actually going to cost you in terms of yield so that means potentially you can sow a greater area than you require without uh, compromising overall grain yields from your farm um, and this is you know this is a result of the investment in breeding of new cultivars which means that we can sow early without that yield penalty um, and i think that's a, a really important um, point to make Particularly in that zone. The other real thing, and you know, one of the one of the key benefits of of having uh, dual purpose crops and winter crops in general in that in in these systems is that uh, for croppers that have, have have a big area to sow, it's actually giving them a spread of sowing time. So um, so it's taking the pressure off the the you know the main season the the, the May sowing period. Uh, when a lot of the crops are going in and allowing farmers to spread that sowing time, uh, which possibly means that they can actually, um, their main season crops in May, they can get them in at the right time and not be compromised by trying to get too big an area in, in too short a period of time. So as I said, a key consideration is, well, is that shift in feed favourable? And, and really what we need to consider there is, um, what livestock are we going to actually have to graze the crops during the winter uh, and, and late autumn period? So uh, for those of you running sheep, um, often that's not that's going to mean that you're not you don't actually have young weaned sheep available to utilize the crops during the winter. And it's actually going to be either late pregnant, lambing, or lactating ewes that are going to be um, the class of livestock that's available to graze your crops at that time of year. And what what we see by shifting um, shifting some of that feed from spring uh, to be available in that autumn winter period is that that it actually is closing that winter feed gap, which is a traditionally a handbrake on that earlier lambing time in terms of the modelling. So Recent modelling by um, Lucy Watt. Again, this is for um, Armadale and Goulburn, so the two the two high rainfall uh, cooler season sites that she modelled. It it certainly made, uh, including dual purpose crops in the system, certainly made autumn lambing a, a much more attractive proposition. I'm not saying uh, necessarily that you you should we should all go out and shift to autumn lambing, but that shifting feed supply does allow that to be a consideration. And certainly uh, I've got there just a figure from uh, um, a survey I did over 10 years ago, just on lambing time in, in uh, the Southern New South Wales area. And it does show that the majority of the producers who responded to that survey were um, lambing through the 
uh, autumn and winter period. Um, so certainly, and certainly when dual purpose crops are part of the system, um, can understand why that might uh, assist them to, uh, to achieve that. So to my fourth point, can dual purpose crops uh, improve livestock performance? Well, I didn't talk about it earlier, but uh, we talked to, uh, about the increase in quantity of feed uh, potentially, and certainly at different times of the year with dual purpose crops in the system, but also the, the crops are high quality in terms of the, their digestibility and crude protein content. So digestibility levels of wheat and canola forage are often over 80%. Um, and, and, you know, um, so an energy density over 12 uh, megajoules um, per kilogram dry matter. And crude protein levels are uh, usually over 15 and, and often over, over 20%. The only time where we can get a bit of a dip in the wheat is towards the end of the grazing period when a lot of the leaf has been removed. But actually, for the most part, generally quite high. So quite high um, quality forages are give a high potential uh, potential for high growth rates. But do need to know, and there's been quite a bit of research on this now, that when grazing weeds, um, we don't, animals don't always achieve the growth rates you might expect. And, and what's been clearly demonstrated is that providing mineral supplements, in particular magnesium and sodium, can increase the growth rate. So, it's been demonstrated for sheep, increasing growth rates of zero to fifty percent, and for cattle, a zero to twenty-seven percent. Now, that's um, uh, what those numbers also show is that providing mineral supplements doesn't always result in an increase. Uh, and what is happening in that scenario is that actually those animals are probably already grow growing at a pretty reasonable rate and actually uh, it's not a mineral deficiency that's holding back growth rates. So so while zero percent increase, they're probably growing pretty well anyway. Why that is, why it happens sometimes and not others, I don't know. Um, but uh, given uh, mineral supplements are pretty cheap, Cosmag, lime, salt, um, not expensive, uh, given the potential upside, if there is a deficiency and your animals will benefit from minerals, then probably worth having them out. Um, but you do, as I said before, you do need to consider the um, the livestock that are available in your system um, at the time of year. So, so in the case of ewes, well, what what have we got? Well, we've um, observed that in uh, um, some in, in um, both experimental and modelling of the systems that um, we do get an increase in ewe weights and that could have a um, positive effect uh, for, for your system in a couple of ways, potentially for um, sale of your cull ewes post weaning, that could mean heavier ewes for um, sale, um, but it also could mean, and the, the Watt paper um, pointed this out recently, um, that could potentially increase your reproductive performance. If the ewes are generally in better condition year round uh, and you're, you're either um, then not needing to su supplement to get them, to keep them or get them up to that condition, or you might get a higher reproductive performance um, from the ewes because they are in better condition. And just a reminder that again, if uh, grazing your late pregnant or lambing or lactating ewes on dual purpose wheats, um, need to be providing supplements that include sodium, magnesium and calcium um, because of the, the increased risk of hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia. And that's because of the very high potassium levels and low sodium levels in the, in the wheat crops. Uh, not not uh, requiring, there's been no evidence to suggest we need to provide mineral supplements when grazing canola. Uh, canola is low in fibre though, so, um, so uh, probably as is a recommendation for grazing most brassicas, providing some straw or, or roughage uh, in the diet could be beneficial. Uh, another another um, effect on um, productivity of livestock is we have demonstrated experimentally that we, um, in the gin and dairy experiment that ewes uh, had an increase in grazing fleece weights from um, from where grazing was prioritised to, to the ewe flock. So, and that didn't have an effect on fibre diameter. And, and I think I pointed out 
in one of my previous slides that in one of the years that increased wool uh, income did have uh, uh, did contribute to the profitability of the system. So do dual purpose crops diversify income? Well, the answer is yes, and that's quite obviously yes if you're in a system where you've uh, where you're livestock only and you're replacing some of your pasture with a dual purpose crop because you're going to get yield from your uh, you're going to also have grain to harvest. Um, which diversifies that income. So live uh, income from your livestock enterprise, as well as uh, from sale of grain. And uh, in, in the uh, financial analysis of the gin and area experiment, um, clearly showed that um, the systems that included dual purpose crops certainly had higher expenses, but also higher total cash receipts and, uh, and profitability. Um, so, so uh, despite a third of, uh, with a third of the farmlets being uh, being converted to dual purpose crops, that resulted, and that was with a uh, lay farming system, um, resulted in increasing the profitability compared to a pasture only system. Uh, the key point to note is that uh, from that, and in terms of our diversification of income, is that the grain income in all years of that gin and dairy experiment was actually a, a important contributor to the increased profitability of those systems. There were other contributors that did change between years. In some, it was lower supplementary feeding, in other, it was the increased wool income. Um, but grain, uh, I've got grain and hay here because they were together in the financial analysis, but that's predominantly grain. Grain, um, and even in the in the event of a, a failed wheat crop, the, the receipts from canola were important in improving the profitability of the system. So uh, diversification of income is quite important. So to move back to a system where um, where we're in the mixed farming zone and we're uh, replacing some spring crops with our winter crops, uh, which is enabling them to grazing. I'm providing an example now using some data from the, the CSU farm, the Charles Sturt farm, and we're big, our farm manager uses a lot of dual purpose crops, canola and wheat, um, and those are utilised by the breeding new flock, but also on the CSU farm, we've got our um, breeding cattle herd. So we've got young uh, weaner cattle um, that are available to graze at livestock through the late autumn and winter period. And I think this is a good example. Um, Jeff McCormick, one of my colleagues, wrote a uh, paper a few years ago and, and noted the experience of a local farmer uh, in the Holbrook district um, or family farm, um, and they were um, actually grazing all of their dual purpose crops. And the way that they were, uh, sorry, grazing all of their crops, the, the way they were achieving that was not with their own life, uh, their, their core livestock enterprise, but by trading cattle, bringing cattle onto the farm uh, each winter to utilise those crops. So, so this is another, you know, diversification of income, potentially, um, that, that situation of, of either trading or adjusting livestock um, can, can add uh, another income stream potentially onto the farm in these systems where your core livestock enterprise cannot utilise all the crops that you've got. So to work through this particular example, this was uh, the data I'm using is from 2022 and we had 250 steers grazing crops from May to August. So they were weighed um, uh, in May, 294 kilograms. Uh, admittedly, the growth rates post weaning had been reasonably low. But uh, when they were reweighed after grazing canola, they'd gained uh, just over a kilo per head per day. And then when grazed at the end of the wheat grazing period, so another 35 days, they gained another um, nearly a kilo and a half per day over that period. So the fin financial analysis that I'm going to add here is actually going to be based on weight gain adjustment um, rather than trading. So trading is certainly an option. And um, John, John Francis discussed this at the recent GRDC update if you want to if you can get hold of that or, or have a look at um, his information. There is risk in that, of course, though, with trading. You've got costs to consider in terms of um, commission, uh, animal health costs, transport costs, et cetera, all need to be incorporated. 
um, but also the uh, the risk that if you aren't able to lock in a price, a sale price, that you're also going to um, have that risk of the market moving against you during the period when you own cattle. The reason why I'm showing weight gain adjustment model is the model that I'm familiar with here is um, there's no costs involved. All Animal Health Transport Commission, et cetera, are all covered by the owner and you're just, just paid based on the live weight gain that you achieve. So you've got no other costs. Uh, the only thing, uh, downside is A, if your growth rates are lower than you expect, you might not um, get as much benefit out of it as um, as is possible. And the sec or secondly, possibly if you're providing mineral supplements, not that they're a huge expense. And the third one is if you have mortalities, that that's going to reduce the total weight of cattle that are exiting your system. Um, this example I'm, I'm providing here hasn't taken into account any mortalities. So what I've calculated here that for the um, 53 day canola grazing period, the gross margin on a DSC per day basis was 29 cents. Uh, and for wheat, that was 26 cents. Now, the reason the canola has come out higher despite uh, lower growth rates on canola is because when I've done that calculation, I've allocated a lower DSC rating to the cattle for the period they graze canola compared to the wheat because those cattle were lighter and growing at a lower rate. So that's uh, that's a reason why that comes out. When we convert that to a gross margin per hectare, and I have I didn't know the actual stocking rates that were used on the farm that year uh, and, and the particular paddocks that were grazed, but based on a assumed stocking rate of 25 DC per hectare, that comes to $384 for the canola and $227 for the wheat. And those two crops were obviously grazed in sequence. So an important uh, concern for anyone who's growing uh, dual purpose crops is the effect on um, grain yield. And this, and what's been clearly demonstrated over longer term is that really that effect can be minimised with good management. So if you um, don't graze before the crops are well anchored and that you remove crops in the case of cereals prior to, at, at, at stem elongation so that the animals don't remove um, the reproductive heads as they move up through the stem. In the case of canola, um, as the buds elongate, so not grazing the canola above 10 centimetres, um, sorry, once the lock up before the buds elongate uh, more than 10 centimetres, then you should be able to um, avoid a yield loss. Um, if, you, if you're grazing later in the season, you do need to also consider the residual biomass um, and ensuring and perhaps uh, uh, needing to leave a bit more behind in the paddock um, to ensure that uh, you're not having too um, uh, too greater effect on that yield. So to to finish off, so I've been through the uh, the, the key six points there on on the way the ways that um, dual purpose crops uh, can be advantageous for a livestock producer, but in the end, the key is. Uh, what are the impacts on uh, risks and return um, to the to the enterprise or to the to the farm? So, um, Lucy Watt's recent paper, what they demonstrated is incorporation of dual purpose crops into the system increased the allowed an increase of the stocking density, increased the average gross margins, and I think a key finding is that it didn't increase the risk in poorer seasons. So, so to show the uh, data for Goulburn and the summarised data for Goulburn and Arvidale that um, they presented, in the when they considered the the worst 20% of years, so the um, so the um, poorest seasons for the sequ for the sequence of years that they modelled, what they found was that um, uh, there was there was less risk by incorporating dual purpose crops. So autumn lambing um, returned three hundred eighty-six dollars per hectare. Spring lambing, three not quite similar, three hundred fifteen dollars per hectare. And this is in the poorer seasons. But the pasture-only system in those poorer seasons, on average, was only one hundred eighty-three dollars per hectare, so significantly less. And in Goulburn, that was um, often a negative return. So just uh, as a final reminder, just um, there are 
uh, other systems benefits, and this isn't an ex isn't an extensive list, but just to uh, to remind you, you know, the potential other benefits of having dual purpose crops in the systems from an agronomic perspective uh, include spreading that sowing window that, that I talked about, so the potential of being able to some sow some crops early uh, and then graze them. Um, while the animals are grazing the crops, you can do a winter clean of your pastures, so it gives you um, some um, some flexibility there in terms of chemical use and, and being able to get onto the paddocks uh, in consideration of withholding periods. Um, and also, um, uh, it's quite common uh, in both um, mixed farming systems and livestock, traditional livestock only systems, to use crops as part of the pasture renovation in terms of cleaning paddocks, allowing better weed control um, so that you actually result in a, in a better pasture establishment when you move back into, into the pasture phase. So in conclusion, um, uh, there, there's multiple ways that dual purpose crops can be beneficial um, to a livestock producer, but we do need to be willing and able to manage the added complexity that having dual purpose crops in the system uh, results in. So things such as you know, the paddock, from a cropping perspective, the extra paddock preparation, consideration of cultivars, sowing time, weed management, um, including uh, withholding periods uh, on chemicals and, and what that means for when you'll be able to put stock onto crops. Um, from a livestock perspective, perspective, uh, I talked about the complicate, the um, extra complexity of, uh, of trading, but also needing to be aware of those risks around animal health um, and pr provision of mineral supplements, um, but also managing those crops to uh, optimise both the grazing and the grain yields from those crops. So making sure you, your management is um, spot on so that you can um, you know, optimise returns from, from the overall system. Uh, we do have a, a new um, long-term systems trial that's just kicking off um, at Wagga and Dookie. I just thought I'd take the opportunity to make you aware this is being funded through the federal government's future drought fund. Uh, so in these um, trials, we, we're um, setting up different systems which are relevant for mixed farming systems and also in comparison to continuous crop. They'll be grazed in, in the case of our Wagga system by um, by composite ewes that are lambing in winter. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's just one to keep an eye out. There's multiple partners there, the Southern New South Wales and Victorian Tasmanian Innovation Drought Hubs, Charleston Uni, University of Melbourne, Tasmanian Institute of Ag. And also um, we've got multiple farming systems groups involved through Southern New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania. Uh, and also thanks to, um, to the support being provided by DPI, um, uh, in terms of advice from DPI, New South Wales DPI, uh, MLA, GRDC, um, and and our local consultants, uh, and also CSIRO, who are contributing to to um, pr yeah providing us some um, good advice and governance on that on that new project. So I've just got some of the key references that I've referred to or used uh, in putting this presentation together. That's there for, for people to look up. One I didn't mention there, but I think is a really handy resource because it's got some of the key, uh, um, it's got um, some of the key things such as uh, growth rates of the crop, um, uh, what farmers have been able to achieve in different systems, et cetera, is the Nicholson um, uh, booklet which is um, available online called grazing crop land so that was put together by grdc uh, so um, so certainly look that up if you're um, if you're interested in getting some more details uh, so thank you everyone for your time and um, i'll stop sharing now um, and happy to answer any questions great Thanks, Sean. There's been quite a few questions come through. So just while, while we're swapping the sharing over there, I'll um, get ready for the first question. So Sean, the first question that we've had come through is, so in frost susceptible areas, could we sow winter crops earlier and use grazing to delay flowering time? Um, I'm not an agronomist, so I'm going to be really cautious here. I think grazing can have an effect, um, but 
I'd also be saying that, um, from my understanding, it comes to cultivar selection, selecting the right cultivar so it's going to flower in the right window and reduce your risk. But that's probably about the extent of my knowledge on that. And, and I think probably talking to your local agronomist would be the way to go. Great, thanks, Sean. Uh, the next one is, could there be an increased possibility of stargazers by grazing cereal crop? I'm not um, not so much aware of that with, as, as a risk with um, our cereal crops. Uh, it is a potential risk with um, brassicas and canola is a brassica. So, so that, is, uh, that is a possibility. Um, in my experience, that hasn't occurred. So, you know, we've, we've lambed down and grazed late pregnant ewes on crops and haven't had that occur, but um, some producers may have had that experience. Does accumulating pasture in winter lead to more wastage in spring when the surplus is already high? Um, it's a good point, and, and the whole question of utilisation is probably um, a, a good one. And certainly when we think about pasture utilisation, um, the Watt modelling study really did find that the key benefits of the dual purpose crops were in systems where the utilisation was higher. Um, my experience from the, the gin and dairy experiment was that uh, what we really saw in that experiment was we didn't actually have extra pasture available in the spring because our pastures were getting eaten down um, more in the autumn period, during that period when the crops were being established and therefore, um, and therefore the accumulation of um, when we came to the spring, basically the pastures in our crop grazing systems had caught up as opposed to um, as opposed to having more pasture available. That was my uh, my interpretation from from that data set. Um, certainly, if you look at uh, uh, John Francis's um, pasture curve that that I that I showed earlier this evening, um, that would suggest that. Um, you, you're moving some of your feed from the spring into the into the winter period, as opposed to accumulating more feed for the for the spring. That follows really well on to the next question that we have, Sean. Is do you see a need to change pasture composition if bringing in dual purpose crops? Um. <sighs> So I'm presuming this is in a in a system we're considering that um, that we're moving from a system that's pasture only. So we might have had you know traditionally mainly perennial pastures, and moving to a system where we've got um, dual purpose crops in the system. Um, I don't I don't have a clear answer on that. I don't know. Um, all I can describe is that in the gin and dairy experiment. Uh, the area that was cropped actually used um, lay pastures, so you used high density legumes um, that were well. Sorry, they weren't they weren't regenerating after the crop phase, but they were being sown after the crop phase. So they're actually using high density legumes in the system with the crops and rotating sort of through two years of the high density legumes, two years of crops. I'm pretty sure they were re-sown as opposed to self regenerating though. The new experiment we're looking at um, at Wagga will include some some lay farming with um, you know comparison of traditional systems with with loosen um, uh, loosen uh, and in comparison to some of those uh, lay farming systems lower input systems will be will be some of the comparisons we're seeking to make. Great, thank you, Sean. Uh, we had another question in relation to that experiment. What was the composition of the hay? Was it cereal or legumes? Uh, I, I believe what they were doing was in the second year of legumes, they were making hay uh, prior to terminating the legumes and moving into the into the crop phase. So I believe it was hay. It was uh, legume hay. Thanks, Sean. What is the cost of supplementary feeding compared to establishing or sowing a dual purpose crop? 
not something I can um, answer off the top of my head. I'd have to actually go back to studies to to look at uh, the comparisons made there. Um, and it's obviously going to vary depending on grain value in a particular year. So, uh, and, and obviously the, the, the costs of sowing and, uh, and crop establishment are going to vary as well too. So no, I don't have a clear answer on that one. Um, I don't, um, so I think that question's coming from a perspective of we better, uh, we better to just feed our sheep as opposed to growing a crop to feed our sheep. Um, but I guess what I was hoping to draw out tonight is um, the potential other advantages in terms of diversification of income, um, um, additional grain potentially in those in those uh, livestock only systems, et cetera. Um, and what that's shown in in those sort of higher rainfall, cooler climates is a is a benefit to replacing a percentage of the pasture with crop. John, uh, would you sow a dual purpose crop if you aren't going to graze it? Um, yes, and I think that's the that was the actual intention, or sorry, the purpose of me showing that slide from um, Felicity Harris uh, of SEPTA compared to uh, winter cultivars is that the improvement in the, the recent improvement and the breeding effort that's gone into um, the dual purpose cultivars, the winter cultivars. And when I say a winter cultivar, I didn't, I don't think I explained that in my presentation, but I'm talking about varieties that are sown early that require a vernalization period. So they need exposure to cold temperatures to, uh, to cause them to move into the reproductive phase. So what uh, that means you can graze early without the the risk of the moving into um, a frost period too early uh, is, is why we have those. But um, the uh, the data that uh, Felicity provided there suggests that, well, actually you can sow those cultivars early, even if you choose not to um, graze them, they will uh, achieve, they can achieve grain yields that are similar to um, spring varieties sown at the optimal time. Okay, we've still got a few more questions here to get through, Sean. There was quite a few that have come through tonight. How does the cost of a dual purpose crop compare to spring pasture if I was considering moving lambing time? I don't have the answer to that, Tanisha. I'm sorry. That's not, uh, yeah, no, I haven't done, done those. I'd say probably the person to ask would be John Francis on, on that one. Okay. Thanks, Sean. Uh, He's not here, about, so I'll, I'll shift it on to him. Yeah. What about cattle grazing crops? I think you covered that in an example as we went through. Yeah. So, so cattle, absolutely. That's um, you know, that's not going to suit everyone. Not everyone's farm is set up to handle cattle, um, but we can achieve um, really good growth rates off canola and wheat. We certainly at the at the Charles Sturt farm at Wagga, that's just a, a part of the system now is that the wiener, the wieners come May, they're going to move on to canola and then wheat. And really, you know, they've been transformed from 300 kilo steers to to 420 kilo steers or 400 kilo steers by the end of winter. And then they're, um, you know, then only another six or eight weeks and they're up to that feed, heavy feedlot weight ready to go. So, so um, can achieve good um, good growth rates. Uh, we put out uh, James puts out straw for uh, the wieners grazing canola, uh, and uh, the rec my recommendation would be mineral supplements for grazing the wheat. Um, it may not always be beneficial, but um, if it means that you get a, a thirty percent increase in growth rate, um, then that's worth what makes it worthwhile. Thanks, Sean. Um, I've had a question that's come through in the meeting chat I've put on Slido. Are all dual purpose crop early season varieties or are there mid season or late season varieties as well that are dual purpose crops? Um, I think the answer is any crop can be grazed. Um, it's just that 
the window for grazing is going to be shorter for those main season varieties, which are sown later. And um, but you could potentially graze them as long as you removed the livestock prior to stem elongation. Uh, that's my understanding um, without being an agronomist. And, and obviously cultivars are going to be depend on location. Um, but um, but you can potentially, and I, my understanding is, and I'm sorry if there's Western Australians here talking for Western Australians when I'm sitting in southern New South Wales, but my understanding is that in a lot of the Western Australian systems, the crops that they use for grazing for or as dual purpose, where they include some grazing, are actually more spring type varieties, later season varieties. Great. Thanks, Sean. And one final question that I've got here tonight is how do you work out if this added complexity is worth it? Look, that's a that's a great question. Um, I think it probably depends on how how hard you're willing to push your system. Um, you know, and whether whether you think uh, the potential extra returns are actually worth that complexity. So I don't know how you work that out. I think that's a personal decision. Um, the The presentation that John gave recently at GRDC was very much well. You know, you need to consider your your own skill set uh, around whether it be cropping, uh, livestock management, livestock trading, and and if your skill set um, isn't going to allow you to do that well, um, uh, then either you need to get some training on that, or you need to, or perhaps reconsider whether that's actually something you should be doing. Do the things that you do well, do them well, uh, and if you're adding complexity, if uh, adding complexity is going to make it harder to sleep at night, well, I think that's probably a a clear answer. Thank you, Sean. What a great way to finish up the webinar this evening. So thank you very much to you for your presentation tonight. And thank you to everyone who's joined us for tonight's webinar. I know that you've definitely shared some great information about dual purpose crops and how to make sure they actually add value to your business. Uh, if anyone here tonight has any additional questions or suggestions for future webinar topics, please reach out to us by completing the survey at the QR code on the screen. This feedback's really important as it actually helps to pick the topics of future webinars. And if you happen to be listening to the recording, there's no deadline or time cut off on this survey, so please also complete the survey. We look forward to you joining us for our next webinar, which is going to be on the 10th of April. We'll be hearing from Jason Condon about liming, how much and when. And if you missed last month's webinar, make sure you head over to the MLA or Agrista website to watch it. And if you want more, be sure to check out our podcast series. You can find it on all major podcast platforms under Productivity and Profitability Series, where we dive a little bit deeper into some of the questions that you've asked on these webinars. So happy listening. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, everyone, for attending.